in grade two, we used to do this thing where when it was your birthday, you got to stand up in front of the class and tell your story. It was kind of a big deal. It was, it was bigger than normal show and tell where you just said what you did on the weekend. It was kind of like a TED talk for seven-year-olds. <laughs> and I remember very well, my birthday was coming up and I went home and I asked mum and dad, what do you think I should talk about for my special show and tell? And they said, why don't you talk about the time we lived in Cambodia as a family when you were younger? And so it was a Wednesday morning. I was very excited. I'd brought some photos to share. I'd prepared my speech. Um, I stood up in front of the class and I said, when I was little, I lived in Phnom Penh, Cambodia on a crocodile farm. And I began to tell my story. Sit down. Don't tell lies. My teacher had interrupted me. And I, I hung my head in shame. I remember tears burning in my eyes and I sat down. My story had been interrupted. Have you ever been made to feel like your story doesn't matter? Because that's how I felt in that moment. And so I guess that sparked something in me. And I think it was the realisation that Maybe it was not a normal experience for a seven-year-old growing up in Queensland to have lived on a crocodile farm in Cambodia. But not only that, that you know, having an experience that was unusual was something to be ashamed of. And I was ashamed. I didn't tell my parents this for years because on some level I blamed myself for show and tell not going according to plan that day. And so my curiosity for Cambodia only grew as I grew older. And I learnt that when we lived there in the early 90s, the country had been in a state of turmoil. And that we'd lived there because my dad had been working for the United Nations. And he was a part of this move to install a democracy after years of colonial rule and civil war and genocide in Cambodia. And I learnt of the sacrifices that my parents had made moving to Cambodia, but also leaving. And I learned that we left Cambodia not so much out of choice, but because my friend, who was four years old at the time, who I went to preschool with, had been abducted, shot in the leg, and left on the street. Because just like me, her dad had worked for the United Nations. And so I understood how lucky I was from a very early age, and I felt my privilege very deeply. And I knew I had to go back. And as soon as I finished high school, I went back to Cambodia and um, ended up starting a small community organisation um, that worked to regenerate the arts. I felt like I was giving back and I felt like I was, you know, on top of the world, I was doing something that I loved to do. And I was getting my education online, long distance, and I was, you know, I was happy. I felt like I was kicking goals. But then all of a sudden, that all changed. I found myself in an abusive relationship. I didn't think that that was something that would ever happen to someone like me. I felt like, you know, I was educated. I understood how these issues played out. My parents worked in social justice. I was smart. This didn't happen to people like me. And so I hid that it was happening because I was ashamed. And I was ashamed because I... I was ashamed that I'd gotten myself into that situation. I was ashamed that I hadn't left the relationship and I was ashamed because I blamed myself. But eventually I did get out and I did so with the help of people very, very close to me. And I realised if that was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do, me with all the resources at my fingertips, a wonderful, loving family. What are other women going through the same thing as I went through, going through? And so I began to talk and I began to tell my story. I became an ambassador for the International Day of the Girl and when I was 24, I stood up in a room like this and shared my story for the first time. And I remember my dad sitting in the front row and seeing tears stream down his face because he felt like he'd let that happen to his daughter. And 
something magical started happening when I started sharing my story. I noticed other people started approaching me and sharing theirs. And I realized that when I was able to be vulnerable enough to stand up and share my story, I could just see the shame in the room wither and die before my eyes. And when I shared my story, I was giving other people the strength and the courage to do the same. And that when I shared my story, other people felt less alone and that I did too. And this changed everything for me, this realisation. I knew that this was the thing that I was going to dedicate my life to. I knew that this was the thing that I needed to dedicate my life to. And so I did. So even though I'd started with a Masters of Regeneration of the Arts in Cambodia, I ended one with a focus on the power of female collective storytelling. So the poet Muriel Rekasa says, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. And I ask, what would happen if millions did? I believe in the power of stories, and when it comes to gender-based violence, our stories are shrouded in shame. Our stories have never been properly recorded, reported, or believed. They've remained invisible, and this has to change. So I started working as a gender advocate, and I saw firsthand how the power of stories could really changed the hearts and minds of people in positions of power. And then I worked on developing a digital mapping tool that allowed women to map out their stories of street harassment right here in Melbourne. And I remember when we were developing it, people said women won't want to share their stories online. That's not something they will do. But they did, and in the pilot alone, 1,300 stories were shared in just the first six weeks. And I knew that we'd harness the power of technology to create an evidence base to inform how we can improve the problem, design safer cities, and prevent gender-based violence into the future. And then the Me Too movement happened, and half a million women shared their stories in just the first 24 hours of that movement last October. No longer were people saying women won't want to share their stories online. They were asking, what can we possibly do about this huge problem? 96 million stories of sexual assault and harassment have been shared on Twitter in the last eight years alone. This is big data, but most of it isn't actually being used to inform how we address the problem moving into the future. So we know that 47 women here in Australia have died this year already from gender-based violence. And we know that nine out of 10 Australian women have said that they have been harassed in public and have had to modify their behaviour as a result of that. And we know that 85% of women, when they are sexually assaulted, do not report it. And so, if these stories aren't being reported, decision makers don't know about them. They don't even know the full story. And if you can't understand a problem, you can't fix it. And so I started my company, She's a Crowd, in order to address that data gap. So we use storytelling data to help address gender-based violence and make cities safer for women. Brene Brown says, stories are just data with soul. And I know women are ready to share their stories and that decision makers are ready to hear them. So She's a Crowd has created a storytelling platform where women anywhere in the world can share their experiences, and those stories are aggregated as data that actually inform how decision makers understand the problem, so that they can address it, so they can design safer cities, better policies and solutions. We're harnessing the power of technology to ensure that our stories don't get left out of the textbooks and the history books this time. So standing up here and sharing my story with you today, I feel powerful and I feel visible. And I want every single woman in the world to have the chance to feel this way too. Thank you. <laughs>